and burn it up. Where are my notes? Okay, if we're doing 10.30 to 11.45, that's an hour, that's one hour and 15 minutes. So, Up. I feel like I'm going to be on fire. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my shirt.
Good morning, I'm Jocelyn Burdell. I just wanna do some check-in real quick. I see Angelina Ferrello and I see Austin Verdeo. Is it Verdeo? Okay. Just yeah, Verdeo. Verdeo, okay. And um, let's see. And I see Christopher. Yep, I'm here. Ham Hello. or ham? Ham. I'm sorry? Ham. Like the, okay. like the like the food yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> i appreciate that i have my sound turned down so low i can barely hear anybody all right and then roman smith i think that's the only person i don't see okay and i'm assuming you want to go in the order of the program sure why not okay. is that fine and then um, we can either do Q&A after each one of your individual presentations or we can do it at the end. I traditionally have been doing them at the end, 
but I'm comfortable either way. I feel like doing, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, I feel like doing Q and A after each individual presentation might work better because then each respective person's presentation is still fresh in our minds to have those questions available. You know, okay. comparatively, whoever went last, that would be the one stuck out most, and we'd kind of no, I don't want okay. anyone to fall to the wayside. Sure, I also tell people to put their questions in the chat also, so I so I'll I'll read questions from there, and so that will give you then roughly about um. About, about almost about 16, 17 minutes for each, each one of your presentations. And so when we get to that point, I will just sort of, you know, wind down with that last question, then go on to the next person, okay? All right. And I have just texted Roman to see whether, where he is. So hopefully he'll come on soon. Awesome. <laughs> I just had a quick question. Um, are these presentations like recorded or um, I'm just not sure this is my first time doing one. I'm sorry, yes, it is It is recording. It's recording, right? It's been recording ever since I logged in. So oh, I'll show oh, yeah, they'll, I take out all that, yeah, they'll take out all this dead space and stuff and start with the actual presentation. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Are the presentations gonna be made available after the conference also? I'm assuming they are. I'm just the moderator, so I'm not 100% no yeah. sure. So, but I'm assuming they're going to be available on their website. That's what most conferences have been doing. So, yeah, making them available after the conference on their website. Which will be great because you'll have something that where you've been presenting virtually, um, like for the rest of your life. So it'll be great. If you can download it to your LinkedIn page. It still feels so strange because um, I presented in person two years ago. So it's just such a dramatic shift. Yeah, I'm getting used to it, you know. In some yeah. ways it has its advantages and disadvantages because you actually can see yourself presenting. So, uh, which makes it kind of nice. You make sure you've got all those right facial expressions going on, you know, whereas before, um, you don't you don't get an opportunity to see yourself and so that's what i like about it oh there's roman true i guess i'm a little biased because i just i really liked baltimore when we went there that was just a fun time yeah oh, okay also i'm a little off topic i apologize for how i sound i'm a little under the weather so i'm like doing the best to push through so but i might be a little nasally i yeah it's that time of the year all right I have 1030. And so I thought that I would begin to get us started. Good morning. My name is Jocelyn Burdell, and I am your moderator for today. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all with us and uh, looking forward to these fabulous presentations about marketing and technology innovation. As we know, a lot has been going on, especially in the techno area, particularly since the pandemic, um, we've had to pivot and to um, operate differently because we're living much more in a virtual world um, as we have been. And so that has um, impacted um, marketing and, and how we do business. Um, and so we've got four presenters today. The first one would be Christopher Hamm from Macaulay Honors College, which is, of the, um, which is part of City University in New York. His presentation will be the business of comic cons, strategies for advertising and economic success. Secondly, will be Rowan Smith from Monmouth, uh, Monmouth University. His presentation is creating a marketable cost structure for New York television and film production. Third is Angelina Forello, Ramapo College of New Jersey. Her presentation will be how just are we in our use of technology? And finally, Austin Berdeo from Malloy College. His presentation will be Humanity in Machines, the importance of ethics in ro robotics and artificial intelligence. And so the format today will be that we will have each presenter present, and then we'll do questions after each presenter. 
and um, and then there will still be a few minutes afterwards if you we want to still have a discussion, um, particularly um, if there's an opportunity to think about how we can can um, look at some of the different presentations and some of the work that's being done and how they can complement one another. And um, the session is being recorded. And um, I had one more thing and it just went right out of my head, I'm sorry. So um, if I remember what that is, I'll say it later. Without further comments from me, we will start with Christopher Hamm. All right, let me share my screen real quick. Yeah, can we all see this? Awesome. Yes. All right, let's start from the beginning. One second, just moving this out of the way so I can see everything. Fantastic. So good morning, everyone. My name is Christopher Ham from the Macaulay Honors College at Queens College. Over the past seven years, I've had the opportunity to travel across the country to conventions big and small. It was at these conventions that I've gotten to meet many hardworking business owners and artists. However, recently, I learned the 45% of all new businesses in America fail within their first five years. Knowing this, I got to work on my project entitled The Business of Comic-Cons, Strategies for Advertising and Economic Success. With this project, I hope to help current and future vendors improve upon their business models to generate more sales at conventions, hopefully growing the community of people that I believe make conventions so special. So a little historical background before we really get into it. Now, the very first recorded Comic-Con happened in my home state of New York during the summer of 1964. This was called Comic-On. This only had about 100 attendees and they got in for $1.50. Now imagine that. The program guide for this is shown right here on the right with legendary artist Steve Ditko drawing the cover. Within this program, we there is an emphasis on the buying, trading, and selling of comic books. Now, although this event was rather small, it laid the groundwork and reflects what we see happen nowadays at conventions. And nowadays they've grown to be true global phenomena with the largest Comic-Con being Comic-Ket, which takes place in Tokyo, Japan. It has over 500,000 attendees during its weekend. But here in the States, we have San Diego Comic-Con and New York Comic-Con being our largest with 135,000 and, and 200,000 tickets um, sold respectfully. Other major conventions can be found in Brazil, London, France, South Korea, basically every continent except Antarctica. Um, with all these people coming to these events, there's also a lot of money to be made. And because these events only happen a couple times out of the year for a couple days, you got to make sure that you capitalize on this. Um, according to the San Diego Tribune, at San Diego Comic-Con, attendees spend $82.8 million at the event alone, which on top of that, they generate an additional at least $147 million to the regional San Diego economy. This is what it looks like outside of the San Diego Convention Center. Tons of people. And here's a look of what the inside of most major conventions look like. On the left, we have comic Cat in Tokyo. And on the right, we have New York Comic Con. Um, as you can see, they're kind of like arranged in these aisle-like formats. And this is very common for large conventions. But I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the pandemic-sized elephant in the room which kind of looks like similar to what this event looks like today. Um, we have Zoom calls with connecting creators and their favorite shows with their fans. Um, this is an example of San Diego Comic-Con at home uh, where we have a Star Trek panel happening on the left side. And on the right, we have a interview between IGN and the new Mad Max movie. Um, so just hoping for the day that we eventually return to Comic-Cons this is what the convention map would look like. Um, this is New York Comic Con back in uh, 2019. And they, large cons are normally separated into two distinct areas, the show floor and artist alley. Now the show floor is where you're gonna find um, all the exhibitors and businesses, everything from the major multimedia companies like Marvel and Warner Brothers. But you're also gonna find the local guys too, the local comic book stores, the small independent publishers, 
Um, you're also going to find the guy in the corner selling t-shirts or Funko Pops and anime plushies. All, everything you're going to find is over there. Here we have over 700 uh, different businesses in one space. On the right side here, we have over 500 artists in Artist Alley. Artist Alley is normally a place where artists and creators all come together. This can, they can be of varying um, levels of experience in the field, varying levels of talent, and also varying levels of price. Now, not every convention looks like this. Um, this is just the, mo the, the major ones, but one that looks smaller would be this one that I got the chance to go to at the end of December, um, the Devotion Comic Art Sale, which happened in um, Long Island. It was here where I spent the majority of my research uh, conducting table site interviews, socially distant, of course, as well as having Zoom calls and phone calls on the side um, with different people in the industry. Here's me on the right conducting one of these interviews there and also um, just a general layout of what this convention looked like. I made sure to get different viewpoints from different people in the industry, everyone from, um, from illustrators to inkers to local comic book store owners and comic book store workers. Um, on top of that, I also spoke to people who organize conventions and just uh, made sure to get as many different viewpoints as I possibly could with the limited access that I had given the pandemic. Um, one question that I made sure to ask all of my participants was if they felt that the convention environment was competitive, collaborative, or both. And a resounding answer has been that it's been both. So I wanna talk about a little bit more of the collaborative side of things. So if you look at a convention, it's very similar and has been compared to a trade show. Um, here, professor and graphic novelist Keith Marison writes that at conventions, comic creators and publishers present their work to the world where they also meet and greet not just their fans, but also commiserate amongst their colleagues. Like I said before, there are hundreds of thousands of people inside a convention that all work in the same industry as each other um, with different levels of talent and different levels of experience. So talking to other people and getting your name out there is definitely going to help. Now, one of the people that I feel exemplified this ideal is Mr. Tony Cordos. Tony Cordos is a, he's typically a DC uh, co comic cover artist. And he's worked on like titles like Batman, but he told me a story of a time where he went to a convention in Texas. Now it was here that he got the chance to meet with uh, Mr. Eric Vale. For those unfamiliar, he is the Act, voice actor for Shigaraki on the uh, English dub of My Hero Academia. It's an anime. And oftentimes just conventions in general, they, they advertise their like celebrities or like very well-known people that's gonna be at the cons to attract people to him. Knowing this, Tony Cordos went to the convention with this piece that you can see on the right. And he showed it to, Cord uh, he, he showed it to Eric Vale. Eric Vale liked it so much that he bought out the entire stock that um, Cordos brought for that weekend uh, in order to sign it and sell it to his fans. Um, this, this type of relationship um, went further to the point where Vale had contracted Mr. Cordos to be the sole um, character artist for Shigaraki for years after the con that they've met. And just in general, the impressions and interactions that you have with people affect your business. Um, reputation affects future business in the sense that um, I've spoken to people who organize conventions and get the people who make up the vendors on the show floor. Um, for example, Phil Russett, he is a, um, an organizer of uh, CreatorCon. And he has told me that there are certain vendors and artists that he won't invite back to his conventions because of the way that they conduct themselves. Um, so just in general, having respect and integrity for other people, the people that you work with and the customers is very important because a sour um, interaction with someone can definitely sour the entire impression that you had for the con experience. And no one wants to have a bad time at a convention. Um, for artists in particular, constructive criticism is something that um, the artists on the right talked to me about extensively where you got to make sure that the, that the criticism itself is constructive and rather so um, not just downright insulting their work. 
because everyone has different tastes in art. Everyone has a different style. For vendors, um, it's very important to have a level of professionalism and knowledge about your work and just interactions with the customers on the show floor. Um, for example, there are important comics uh, in the field like Hulk 181 or Ultimate Fallout number four. Um, if, you know your, if you know your comics, then you know the significance of these books and you know that they go for a lot of money. Anyone can look this up on their phone and anyone can um, check the price on eBay. So definitely knowing it offhand um, shows that you mean business, that you know what you have. And just in general, people who tend to sell at conventions are normally fans of the material themselves. So having conversations with people and just sharing your passion for the field um, can get, definitely get you a long way. Treating people like people and not like dollars. But for the competitive side of things, um, this is an example of what a typical artist alley could look like at a convention. As you can see, everyone's kind of close together and you can see what each other's doing. Um, something that's very common in artist alley is to um, ask for commissions. This is um, like where an artist will draw something for a customer, give it to them, sales made. But um, with the nature of everyone being so close, you can often see the prices of other people. It might be worthwhile to lower the prices of your commission rate in order to match someone else's or even lower to make a sale. Uh, just in general, because everyone's so close together, everyone gets to know each other. And you can also see how other people are presenting their work. Um, one of the people who I spoke to at Evolution Comics told me how this display here, he learned how to do this by looking at someone else's display. And this is a display that I feel um, is very effective in the sense that up here, you have this like grid system where you can easily display your art um, and people can see it from afar. People can see your art style and know what you're working with. Um, also notice the different colors that they use, a lot of reds, a lot of yellows, and a lot of popular characters. Um, this will only help you to attract other customers to your booth. In general, you can see that they have like con uh, specials and they have the prices easily displayed. Um, but also on the table, you have these portfolios here. Now these portfolios can either help or hinder you depending on the customer that you're dealing with because yes, it stores a lot of art and people can easily flip through it, but that accessibility to flip through it also hurts in the sense that um, people can just take like handfuls of pages and just to get through the portfolio a little faster and just essentially skipping a lot of the art. Um, going forward, this is another example of a good pre, uh, present, presentation of someone's work. Um, this is artist Keith Williams. He's the artist of, of the Phantom like TV show and also has been published through Marvel and DC, what have you. Behind him, he has this banner where it shows his name what he does and his credentials. And it also has the, uh, the different works that he's published because you never know what's really gonna resonate with someone. So just having a variety of work displayed is very important. There's also something that he, um, he showed me about his presentation in general. Um, just having a tablecloth also leads into that level of professional, professionalism that someone has when they're presenting at a show. Also, if you can see the way that he designed his setup, you have the like cartoony, more colorful characters down at the bottom or having more of the inked professional, more expensive work on top. And this is done deliberately in the sense that children would be able to see what's down here because they're closer to the ground. So you can never really underestimate the power that a child has over their parent's wallet. So if they see something, they might as well drag the parent over there and try to make a sale. Um, so this is also done with like sugary cereals at the grocery store and just in general. Um, but although like there are much more uh, tips and tricks that you can learn from people who are in the industry, definitely um, talking to them and just having a good conversation about their experience, any advice that they can have you, as long as you credit them, everything is good. Um, hopefully the impossible problem that we hope to solve is eventually when we come back to conventions that we'll be able to come back stronger and better than ever to generate more sales and to grow the people that make the cons what they are. My name has been Christopher Ham. If you have any questions, I am free to answer them. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Christopher. That was that was a great presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, here's the first question. Christopher, what was your best, oops, what was your best experience at these conventions? Are there certain aspects of the portfolio that should be included to bring an interest to those that are interested, especially with limited qualifications? Sure. Um, so great questions. One of my best con experiences in particular um, was one time I had the opportunity to see Stan Lee at his last um in-person showing on the East Coast at Boston Comic-Con in 2016. And this was really special because of course he passed, um, but I was able to meet him. Uh, he was able to sign something for me and I got to see him at a panel and really he was just full of life and he was everything you wanted him to be um, that you see on the big screen. So that was really special. Um, and to address the other question about the aspects of portfolios, a lot of the time, what people tend to do is kind of group the, um, the theme of the pieces in the portfolio. So you'll have like, you can arrange it by like all the Avenger stuff is here, all the Harley Quinn stuff is here and Superman and so forth and so forth. So if people do start like flipping through it, there are distinct sections where they'll be able to see everything in that section and stay with that section. Uh, and just in general, um, if your work is very clean, like the edges aren't like scuffed up and like just having like the prices displayed also making sure that you're in a reasonable price point on the portfolio could also help bring people in also. Great. Uh, Roman? Yeah, hi, Christopher. I actually went to the Comic-Con with my mom in Philly a couple of years ago. It was awesome. I dressed up as Captain Kirk. But I was wondering, <laughs> from, a, from, a, from a marketing standpoint, like how do they decide the prices to give when they're giving those meet to greets to actors? This kind of goes over into my topic, but do you know how they determine like an actor's level of popularity towards what they charge? I always thought that was so interesting because you could tell that some were valued more than others, some C-list actors, you know what I mean? No, yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of the time, these actors are represented by an agency. So really it's the agency that's coming up with these prices, not the actors themselves, because I've definitely gone online with an actor and like, you can ask for like a selfie, like when you're actually in front of them and then they'll just do it as opposed to like having to charge for one. Like if the actor was in charge of the prices, it'd be very different, but really it's the agency. No, that, that makes total sense. It does. Does anybody else have any questions? Austin? Do you feel like there's, <clears throat> I know you mentioned before how with people, they have to have a certain level of professionalism, you know, likability, like mannerisms, things like that to be kept around. Do you feel like there's often a threshold for certain more of the celebrity members where they can almost, forgive my language, for lack of a better word, get away with being a bit of an asshole because they're just that famous, that there's that, you know, Comic-Con and their agents know that they're still going to bring in money, even if they're kind of rude. Like, do you feel like there's a certain point where that'll still kind of happen? Yeah, for sure. I mean, with a celebrity in general, you already know that they're going to attract crowds. Like people who are fans of that celebrity, they're going to go to that con wanting to meet that celebrity. But really, um, the, the level of professionalism really matters for the lesser known people the vendors and just like the artist on the show floor and artist alley, because they're the ones who are really hustling. The, the uh, celebrities, they kind of already have it made for a weekend. A, an artist or a vendor, they can go into a weekend and lose money. They never know what's gonna happen. So definitely making sure that they have enough opportunity as possible to make sales, super important for the, for the smaller guys. Thank you. No problem, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so next we'll hear from Rowan Smith from Monmouth University. Yes, let me screen uh, screen and share here. Do, do, do. Okay. Um, now, let me know. Yeah, oh, here's, let's go back in the presentation here for a minute. <laughs> One second. Okay. 
Wonderful. I'll start. Hi, I'm Roman. Uh, my, my title here is Creating a Marketable Cost Structure for New York Film and Television uh, Production. So here I'll move into this. Great. So we'll start off here just with a quote from one of my interviewees, mine, uh, my project here, and listed a lot of interviews to figure out what was going on in the uh, New York film and television industry. The first one here I like a lot because it explains sort of what I did. One of my interviewees, uh, she went by the name Caroline, which I changed everybody's names for anonymity, but she was a pretty successful commercial actor whose career I admire. And I said, I'm a business marketing student. You know, I'm an, also an actor. But right now, my whole thesis is to make a market study of what's going on in New York. And she goes, kudos to you. I really admire your attempts for control or something. And, and that's really what this thesis was, me trying to... This, this huge industry fraught with nepotism theory, marketing, accounting, economics, um, qualitative data through all of these interviews in the hopes of trying to find something to analyze this market behavior to see where it would go forward after the pandemic. Um, in essence, I just brought up the Rolodex that I had from 10 plus years of working within the film and TV industry, called everybody I knew and said, what is going on in New York and how can we make this better? So the purpose behind this was, like I said, I. Uh, my background is in acting. I've been a child actor for years. I now have a job as a pitch deck designer for international clients where I help small businesses and international creators make pitches for TV shows, which they then on go on to produce with uh, companies like Bravo and Lifetime, and most recently the History Channel. And I'm also a student in the honors school in business marketing. I'm going to graduate this upcoming summer, and I want to have a competitive edge to get into this industry to figure out what is going on and how I can make it better. So this industry is big uh, because of the pandemic, but there's a lot of money here. And, and this is not the only market too. Mm -hmm. we look. Further, there's New York City, the other huge hub. I say. And honestly, the answer to that is artists used to have a lot more control over how they sold their own work. I then looked. Oh, oh no. Can you everybody hear me? No, we can. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me, I'm, thank you, Dr. Mezzi. Let me know if something cut out. Did, did that, did that, what happened? Anybody know? You might want to go back and redo that whole previous slide because. <laughs> okay. Yeah, a lot of cutouts. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, Roman, I don't know whether you can turn off your, if you turn off your video, will that prevent you from sharing your screen? Because sometimes that helps with the, um, Internet. I don't know whether what happens when you do that, though. At least understand me here. Yeah, try it now. OK, I'll uh, I guess I'll start here, which was just me explaining how big the market for for New York is. If that happens again, just please chat me. Um, so like I said, there's a five billion dollar industry. There's a lot going on in New York, and it's only one of the major hubs of production right now. So the other one, of course, is in Los Angeles. There's also ones in the West that are popping up uh, in the Midwest, sorry. And of course, in Europe, there's a lot of money in production. So my thesis was broken into two parts, the first being a marketing approach, the second being an accounting approach. This is part of my literary review. And then I synthesized all of the information after my interviews. So this marketing approach is bro broken down into four perspectives. I'll briefly talk about what they are. You can read them here, the old and the past. 
And then I looked at the endowment and grant model, which they say is the number one way in which artists get money through uh, grants and endowments in the government. But right now there's a lot of, uh, there's not enough exposure to these grants. So artists aren't really getting them as much. Uh, and then of course I looked at the subscription services model of art buying, which is the most popular one. Think about your Netflix accounts and your Hulu subscriptions. And then finally, I looked at the classic advertising model and I used a case study of TikTok using their interstitial ads, their full screen ads, right when you enter the app and that gets them money. Uh, and just distribution deals. Okay, the second is an annuity and interest model. Oh my goodness, I'm frozen. Now you're... I don't know what is going on. This is... You're back. All right. I don't know. <laughs> I wish I could help it. I don't even know what's going on. Maybe um, if we turned off our videos also, it would help I, load faster? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Like, whatever you think. Yeah. There's, it's looking okay from my end. What I'm wondering is, are there other people in your house's Wi-Fi that are also using up a lot of internet? Because that might be what's disrupting the data flow. Um, you know what? If it becomes an issue, no is the answer. So if it becomes an issue again, uh, please let me know. But this is quite odd. Um, okay. So where were we here? Uh, accounting approach. So like I said, I did three perspectives, annuity and interest growth model where art was being functioned as an investment that grows over time. Think about your NFTs that are popping up right now where people are buying digital art with the hopes that they will grow over time. The second was the bidding and pricing model, which is this kind of blurry line where artists and uh, market executives interact with bidding and pricing of their own work. And unfortunately, this is the most popular used in the production industry right now. And then I did an accounting case study of two companies, one that failed and one that is currently operating well, which was HQ, the interactive game show, and Cameo, which uh, uses celebrity cameos sent to people. Uh, for my interview portion of the um, thesis, I broke it down into an industry analysis. This was actually taken from my coursework here at Monmouth, an entrepreneurship textbook, which I thought gave a good framework and scheme for how an industry analysis should be done. Okay. Accounting approach. And then I did these inter transcribed all of these interviews using Liger before Zoom had a closed captioning feature, which would have saved me so much time. And then I synthesized it into a market analysis. The questions that I'm going to answer here in the next slide are how crucial are the role of intermediaries in production, like Christopher was saying, who are these agents that will avoid the negative aspects of the industry as a whole? And what is the future of this industry? I'll spend a little time on this slide. This is where my, my conclusions were drawn. So after all of these interviews were done and transcribed. Second spot on a that high competition that bleeds into the rest of the ansible. Second was the merit. This kind of goes more into the artistic and creative side, but the leaders within their industry feel that the merit of their artistic work is a secondary factor to the bureaucracy that takes control of the industry. That means that some artists feel a bit disillusioned with their work, whereas um, they feel that it's more inclined towards the monetary principles of the industry instead. Specialization, there was actually a rift in my interviewees where I said, is it better to be a specialized artist or just kind of a Renaissance man, good at many different things? And uh, people didn't know. They said, you know what? I would rather be the best in my field, but also I see the appeal of this gig economy, getting money in any direction that it flows towards me in. I looked at the future, of course, of this industry, and this was during the pandemic. So I looked at how productions are having to put up these expensive ventilation system, how extras, which were usually a bottom line on the accounting book of productions, now had to be in hotels for quarantine, which adds to the labor cost. And the end of the story was that digital animation and anything that can be produced remotely is going to win the day. 
Um, I looked at the industry disruptors of our uh, media landscape here, what's happening. I looked at NFTs. Um, I looked at TikTok and how that is contributing to the content that we see. And then finally, that agency. So once again, these unions and agents and people who fight for the creatives, do they have the best interest of the creatives at heart? Most creatives say no, and then most union leaders would say yes. That's the age-old struggle. How TikTok does its own. And then I turned uh, uh, that in, into a second idea. So we just I saw it just yep it cut out there completely. So I, I apologize for that. Mm. Um I I mean if you'd like I can finish off. I I, I am beside it myself. Was going, I don't know. <laughs> it was going pretty well there for a minute. And then oh when you, after you got to that disruption piece on your on that la last slide talking about disruption, yeah. it, it went out again. I mean, listen, I know we're probably going over time. I could finish it up real quick. Whatever you think is best. I uh I don't know what is going on. Yeah, why don't you go on and I, I'm I'm okay with you finishing up real quick. Just go right ahead. Two slides left. Uh, um, I can see you guys now. I don't know what the issue is. So let me just mm -hmm. finish off. Roman, would it be possible maybe to take a JPEG really quickly, like a screenshot and just show the screenshot? I'm wondering whether it's the size of the program that um, is disrupting. Okay. I appreciate everybody. Uh, hang yeah, that's a great point. I'll try anything. Let me just do that real quick. I actually have a PDF up right now too, in case something happened. So I will just yeah, try the PDF. That might actually um, that might actually be better. Okay. Yeah. Oof. That's right. You're doing great. It's a great project. <laughs> just my luck, huh? Um, all right. Let me. Uh, <laughs> let me. I think if we learn anything from COVID and, and uh, Zoom and technology is that in the business world, as well as in our professional lives, we just have to be able to pivot and be patient. That's right. So, um, yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. So here we go. Hold up. Hopefully this will cause us all our issues. Um, hmm? Yeah. Okay. Let me yep. just check. Can definitely yeah, okay, see great. that. Yes. Yeah, good. All right. Perfect. So I, I'm just going to start from these future concepts. So anyway, if you caught <laughs> hey roman you're still cutting out why don't you turn your... beforehand if that's even possible yeah why don't you do yeah. it without can you can you just uh roman i have a suggestion um yeah, what, what wi-fi are you connected to if anything if you have data on your phone to connect to your phone's data for, instead and then present your Slide. Oh, that's a smart idea. But I, you know what, if this, this long into it, I, I feel like I'd just be wasting time connecting to my phone, honestly. Um, but I mean, can you just hear me? I can just talk through it for the next yep. two minutes. Great. Yeah, we can definitely hear you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, whatever. I don't know what's going on here. Um, okay. So I synthesized it into two different ideas. The first one was that I wanted to make something that brought a little bit more of meritocracy back into the media production agency after talking to all of my actors and my directors. And the idea that I had 
was that artists would offer up their work, right? They would send in their art projects and then in return, they would kind of get what I called clout or merit based on who they submitted their artwork to. And it, it functions similar to how the TikTok algorithm does without us even knowing the sort of AI involved with that. And then the second thing I went on to uh, develop, which I am currently developing, which I, I would show in my slides here, is the idea of just transposing the entire media industry, the film production, how it works into the theater industry. Right now, theater is really fraught. We don't know what's going to happen with it. And my idea was this concept I called front row media, where you would put on a VR headset and be able to interact with your stage play in the 360 degree media landscape that you would see from really high quality movies. And I started developing that. Even as my last semester in college, I started a little kick, uh, Kickstarter campaign and GoFundMe. me. I was talking with my advisors about how my target audience might be affected by this. I slowly found out that I am one of the only people who can stand watching a live stage performance via VR, but we're still working on it. But right now it's, currently being developed. I'm thinking about how I can apply these principles into what I do out of college. And it has served me pretty well, even within my own small business, uh, producing, like I said, those pitch decks for my international clients. But this is the part where I would say thank you for listening. And please let me know if you have any questions or if I can clarify anything that I said in the past 15 minutes. Thank you, Roman. It was a great job. It really, really was. Um, and I'm so sorry that we were having some of the internet um, issues. Um, does anyone have any questions? So I, 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 okay. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's fine. Me? Yeah. Um, no, yeah the, the VR app that you were mentioning sounds really interesting. Like, um, how do you like where is it right now and where do you want it to be yes yeah, so i actually i'm currently developing and i'm trying to learn the ins and outs of of how vr is going to work but there's this uh big thing called unreal engine it's how the mandalorian on disney plus was produced this this huge graphics engine that i love and so i'm trying to learn uh, how to produce it but the idea would make try to make these realistic um, theater performances that are somehow captivating, maybe less long form, but that an audience member could put on their VR glasses or in some way connect to their monitor with the full access and immer immersion and kind of see plays again. Because I love plays. I was a huge theater buff for mostly plays, not, not really musicals, but I just liked acting and seeing it close up. So I wanted to try to recreate that performance and uh, it might be through VR that that is the best avenue for that. But still, like I said, idea phase and just something to apply these this research to, you know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they do concerts like that now. Why not plays? Exactly. You're right. Why not plays? I don't know. <laughs> Nancy, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, along the same lines as, as to what Krista was saying, because the last time I saw your presentation, which was, um, I think, last year, you were actually thinking that people were excited about the VR <laughs> and, and now you're saying that people don't necessarily want to watch um, on VR. And I'm wondering, is that a gener do you think that's a generational thing? Or do you think that's a, I mean, I, and I'm wondering how, for example, uh, the New York Times, you know, when they sent out all those cardboard, like, yeah. did, did they also find the same thing? Like, people are not so interested in that? Or they're keeping it going? Like, or is that just sort of a, are we tired of just looking through a, a small thing at a large screen? Um, it and, is, maybe the, and maybe after Zoom, I'm sorry, after COVID, we'll actually enjoy that instead of feeling like it's in a, another, uh, what's your thought on that? Well, like, yeah, it's funny you saw this presentation a while ago because I was so excited about it. And then I kind of looked into who's watching what and how long they're staying captive in these things. And, and VR is sort of interesting because it can get a little... Um, it can get a little strenuous if you're not watching the right way. And also just lots of like the, the target audience for VR is younger, but the target audience for theater is older. So it's like, mm -hmm. how, who's really going to watch this and, and how long are they going to be watching this? So that's the kind of problem that came up as I started developing these ideas. I think I'm sadly an old soul who only likes to watch national theater live productions of plays and nobody really else in my age group does. So I got to find a new target market to cater that to. Thanks. Austin, I see Austin. Yeah, what's up? Any other questions before we move on? I saw Austin was, yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Austin. Two quick questions. Um, yeah. One, do you feel like with presenting this in a VR format, even if it ideally worked out, do you feel like that also poses a threat 
of piracy where then people could easily screen record to capture it and then kind of share it thereby devaluing the productions because now people could just go out of their way to watch it virtually instead of going through the proper channels. Um, that's a great point. And that's what happened with Quibi. If you remember one of the little case studies I did was Quibi existed for a while and then people just put all their episodes on YouTube and they quickly uh, crashed. It was a $3 billion company that just failed. So yes, that is an issue, but there's companies that do it right. Like I said, one of my favorite companies right now is the National Theatre Live out of the UK. They have a secure system where they have all these wonderfully produced theatre productions that are accessible to their subscribers, and they really are tight about how they put out their content. And it's really high quality content. So I, I think it can be done, but um, it, it's just, you got to put thought into it, which is what I'm trying to do. No, that's awesome. And then um, the other thing, maybe it was like a healthy medium. So like, now, obviously, a lot of people, they don't want to have, like, the cardboard box in front of their eyes from the <laughs> yeah. ER, and we can't exactly go in person right now. Mm -hmm. What about, like, the 360 videos where they could just view it on a regular screen, but they could still change their angle to see all the different perspectives? And that and that's, uh, that's actually a fantastic idea. I think when I was building my Kickstarter campaign and trying to figure out how it would work, I think that would be where I go next is... Right. Having that almost like an AR experience, I think what you're talking about, where you kind of, yeah, where you can move your 2D screen around in a virtual space. I think that would be the perfect middle ground. So, yeah, I think you got it, Austin. I would I would go from that uh, area, too. Oh, I was thinking more like you have the screen and you can kind of click and drag to rotate your perspective. Oh, but doing AR, yeah. too, that would also be really interesting. Yeah. Probably but no, harder the, to implement, <laughs> but like ideally it would be awesome. Yeah, no, that's a really great idea. And I'm going to think about that. Thank you. Great. Seeing that we don't have any more questions, I'm going to move on to Angelina Ferralo from Ramapo College of New Jersey. Thank you. Alrighty. Good morning, everyone. Um, just give me one moment as for some reason it's not working for me to share my screen. Okay, for some reason, I did reset the, um, like, uh, what's the word? Like, allow to allow my screen to share, but it's still saying it's not. Um, so I don't think I'd be able to share my screen without, like, leaving and coming back. So to save time, um, I'm just not going to do that. It's fine. I just had, it was more like an outline just to kind of follow along with the presentation. Angelina, an option would be, if you want, I can have... Um... Austin to go and then you go last if that's okay sure yeah I mean would I be Austin, able to email it to anyone and maybe they could just kind of click through it for me we could do that too but so just in just with time I just want to if you want to email it or or see if you can reset it and Austin yeah, I'll, I'll have yeah that's fine I'll reset it that's fine okay all right Austin all right, why right you back. go all right okay. terrific uh, sure yeah Share screen. That makes me feel better a little bit. <laughs> it makes me feel a little bit better that everybody's having a little issue. All right. Is the um the PowerPoints up, right? Yep, you're good. All right, awesome. So hello. My name is Austin Verdeo. I'm from Malloy College. And contrary to how stoked I am on all this computer science jazz, I'm actually an art student but I also have an interdisciplinary major for marketing and computer science. And it is a special kind of frustration, but fun nonetheless. And today I'm presenting to you about humanity in machines and the importance of ethics in robotics and artificial intelligence. Before I really dive into it, I just want to clarify a few things that to, with regard to definitions, I guess. So robotics relates to the development and existence of machines that substitute or replicate human actions, but don't necessarily have to be like the humanoid robots that we sometimes tend to think of. And then also um, the difference between artificial intelligence, I kind of use this as a broad term. I know sometimes we also equate that with machine learning, which is actually a subset of artificial intelligence. While um, artificial intelligence itself is a machine being able to essentially simulate human thinking capability and behavior. So with that aside, what I plan on presenting to you today is not only issues within robotics and artificial intelligence, but also how they are used, how um, certain resources for these, for the hardware is obtained and the effects it has on both humanity and the environment. 
So to start, I'd like to speak about military and police use and more specifically start with police use to which if some of you are familiar with Boston Dynamics, they've put out this weird little guy right here and all sorts of other robotics. They're one of the top ones in the country when it comes to robotics. And they've been beginning to do contracts with police departments. So for example, they have a device called Spot, which is almost like a robot dog that they've been putting out and allowing police forces to use in hopes of it to, for now, just be able to scope out certain areas without having a human in that condition where it might otherwise be dangerous. But a fear that's easily brought upon as expressed by Kay Crockford, the Director of Technology and Liberty from ACLU of Massachusetts, is that there's a sort of deadly potential because state police robotics programs are often not very transparent and coupled with that spot could theoretically be weaponized and then you know, used for any sort of harmful matters to which I don't think the technology is 100% there to be able to safely allow that. And at one point, Boston Dynamics actually went on record saying that they don't want to sell Spot because they fear the violent use of their machines. That was back in 2019. Meanwhile, now 2021, you can go right to their website and it's for full sale instead of leasing. So clearly they've kind of stepped back on that notion, which means even within legal parameters, police would be allowed to use that. Another idea that leans more towards the artificial intelligence side of things is the police use of facial recognition software, which while it isn't inherently bad because it can be effective in some cases, the issue is it doesn't have a consistent accuracy level that's high enough yet to really warrant it being used in such a high stakes procedure such as policing. As it even performs worse upon women and people of color. For example, the National Institute of Standards and Technology within their database these facial recognition softwares were anywhere from 10 to 100 times more inaccurate when it came to identifying African Americans or Asians compared to white men. And then along with this, there are now attempts to, to assess emotional state and age based solely on visual cues, which is an extremely subjective matter, especially when you think about people who might come from different ability or neurodivergence where their facial expressions or emotional outputs may be extremely different than you know a neuro sorry than a neurotypical person and it creates almost a sort of bias against them as well to which you know someone who might just simply be an anxious person or someone who's exhibiting a trait that someone deems as anxious through this surveillance technology might be automatically pinned as looking a bit guilty and if they happen to have some similar features to someone who they're looking for you know they end up getting tracked down and thought to be the person possibly and there's just like the use of the technology itself is not inherently bad, but it's not at a good enough point to be safely used. And that's the greater issue. And then likewise with the military, there's the issue of the military digital complex, which is the militarization of cyber operations used by the government and corporations. And I guess a very popular and very appropriate example would be defense against cyber terrorism. You know, you can look up, there's like video displays of the amount of cyber attacks on the US and on other countries every day. And it's just like hundreds of blinks of lights per second to show how many attacks are occurring so frequently on the day. So obviously something like that is necessary. However, there are also much less appropriate examples of this kind of use such as drone warfare. The US military supposedly holds a just ad bellum and just in bello stance, meaning that there's a specific set of criteria for going to war and criteria for behavior during war. But the use of drones poses an ethical issue, both in the human disconnect and the abuse of the drones themselves. Because a lot of times it's trying to be automated, which, you know, that lack of human use not only reduces the human empathy element, but also when they're trying to analyze for people. But obviously, you know, soldiers and militaries of other countries are aware of this. They will sometimes have their soldiers and combatants in plain clothes or much more well disguised clothes, meaning that the detection of combatants versus non combatants becomes increasingly difficult. And even if a human is controlling the drone, still looking at things over a screen versus face to face decreases any sort of empathy and makes it much more, makes people much more willing to pursue these drone strikes and can also decrease 
the amount of regard towards the destruction of the innocent human lives, destruction of property in the general civilian areas. And I didn't even want to put any photos of the kind of destruction it's done to civilian area areas. That's just absolutely heartbreaking. I don't, I don't want y'all to have to see that if you don't want to. And then on a similar notion <clears throat> with um, SpaceX, one of Elon Musk's various companies that he owns, they've already signed three military contracts with the US Department of Defense because they want to use that technology for weapons delivery as well as issue tracking. And while that isn't inherently bad, it kind of opens the gateway for a further development within the military industrial, military digital complex buoyed by these established contracts. SpaceX, SpaceX is the start, but it creates almost a sort of social acceptance and corporate acceptance towards military and modern tech cooperation, which could then lead to more use of artificial intelligence, robotics, to which allowing these you know, machine control devices going into war poses a lot of issues, one of the biggest ones being data bias that can exist within it. So similar to how I mentioned before, one example of data bias that I said was the issues of detecting faces of women and racial minority groups, but data bias in general isn't restricted to only that. And to put it simply, it means that having biased data as the input for a machine will lead to a biased output. You know, just because a study shows a certain result or a survey gives a statistic doesn't mean that those studies are inherently true. And likewise, you can find a range of studies, but if they're biased towards a certain result and you're only putting in those ones, then obviously there's going to be a skewed result. And people too often are so willing to trust any sort of technology output where, oh, if a machine did it, then it must be true. And a simple but kind of funny example I found when it comes to data bias is, think of it this way. A man's trying to create a report on whether or not Russian roulette is deadly. So he goes around and he interviews 10 people, all of whom said, yeah, when I played Russian roulette, I survived. So his conclusion, Russian roulette must be 100% safe because all the interviewees lived after it. Obviously, you see the issue there. And just general case studies have displayed not only the bias and unreliable outcomes when identifying facial features, but even in regards such as with job applications being automated, there's the issues of facial features and body language. Programmers have tried developing methods of determining facial features or facial structures that are more or less trustworthy, for example, or body language that's seen as more or less professional. And the facial feature examples tend to be in favor of white men as features predominant in Hispanic and Black people, such as maybe, you know, a slightly wider nose or slightly larger lips, it's associated within the program as less trustworthy. And on a similar notion, kind of like I was talking before about ableism, trying to automate the process of analyzing body language can be inherently ableist, because if someone has a form of a physical or verbal tick or a neurodivergent person who just may not be capable of prolonged eye contact or find themselves prone to stimming are automatically put at a disadvantage, which directly goes against the typical non-discrimination policies that places are supposed to have. Now, there's also a set of environmental and human rights issues that come along with robotics, typically associated with the waste or the obtention of materials. And one of the most horrible ones as, you know, put lightly with only this photo, as opposed to the ones that are much more heartbreaking to see, is the issue of the Congolese cobalt mines, to which there is an issue of child labor and general exploitation of the Congolese people to obtain cobalt, which is used to create lithium ion batteries, which powers most of our devices, whether it be robotics, smartphones, and the like. So this is not necessarily specific to robotics, but still relevant to it enough that I felt the need to talk about it. It's putting these people's health, their lives, and mental well-being in danger, all while underpaying them and getting no true support by the multi-billion dollar companies who benefit off their labor, such as Apple or Tesla or Google. The other environmental issues associated with robotics are physical disturbances, pollution, and habitat destruction posed by them. The use of robots in warfare, such as the drones, means that when they're shot down or destroyed, the debris is left to just carelessly afflict wherever it lands, disrupting whether it be wildlife communities are disrupting human communities. The amount of e-waste created by machines is still not at a point where 
it can be properly disposed of or requires a lot more effort, which often leads to, you know, waste waste handling companies do not really want to deal with that, and they just dispose of it as you know whatever, leading just the buildup of waste and other potentials for pollution from the different metals. And the um, sorry, and there's also the pollution that comes along with the general mining, to which it's disrupting the habitats. Anything goes into the air, into the water. There's just a lot of issues relating to the environment that are posed by the improper collection of materials for this. It's not to say that you know to have machines or robotics is bad itself, but the way it's presently handled is the biggest issue with it. And my gripes with big tech don't really stop with their exploitation of the Congolese people because it's also the issue of big tech and big data and how they kind of invade our privacy in a sense. Because big tech, as well as smaller companies, they pose a series of issues due to their, you know, just wide expanse and how much essentially digital power they have over everyone. Big data itself, which as it sounds, is a very large collection of data. And while it's seemingly useful for fields like psychology, marketing, or defense, it also comes with its own set of issues, the greatest of which being the potential for information to fall into the wrong hands. And we would assume that these mega companies like Facebook, Tesla, Google, that they'd have this unbreakable cybersecurity and our data would be safe. But even within the last two years, there's been data breaches with Facebook that have exposed over 530 million people's information via Facebook. And even with the surface level information, like just phone number, name, and what city you live in, you can find someone's exact address. I actually do that at work because you know we want to make sure that a sale is actually proper and not fraud. So, you know, I have the person's name, I have their address, I go to whitepages.com, reverse search them. It's that easy to find someone's address, name, family, and if you pay the money to the website, even more information. So this kind of data breach poses a bigger threat than people realize beyond just, oh no, I'm losing my Facebook account. Similarly with Tesla, hackers were able to essentially break into a Tesla X within less than the past year. It's not like this is a fusing, this is like recent. They were able to unlock the doors and even control the car. And that is an immediately life-threatening issue that needs to be worked on instead of placing such a blind faith into these corporations. And, you know, it's, there needs to be more extensive R&D done instead of just allowing them to do this. And there's also digital companies who are guilty of obtaining and sharing certain information without people knowing or taking advantage of it. So like, you know how when you go online, you'll search up like a new game or a pair of shoes or whatever, and then you see ads on it everywhere? That's because of pixel tracking. Also, I apologize if I'm speaking a little faster. I'm trying to stay within time. Pixel tracking is a snippet of HTML code that can essentially take certain information from you, whether it be when you're accepting cookies or it's taking, you know, your web traffic or site conversion information. And on normal use, it basically helps the website owner try to improve their strategies. But that information is also sold and spread to however many parties, and it's technically legal because you accept it, but it's still just unjust because it goes very under the radar, but it's still sharing so much information. And similarly, the last issue I want to speak about is microtransactions, which is, for anyone who doesn't know, within video games, there are small purchases for in-game content, whether it be functional or purely cosmetic. And while seemingly harmless, there's a certain level of machine learning used to it that's really unsettling because it'll analyze a user's gameplay and see when they're struggling most and try to hit them with an ad or a deal for a microtransaction to approve the odds. And with regards to things like the loot crate, where it's randomized, it's essentially, you know, it teeters on the line of being gambling, to which, you know, these games, whether they're aimed at kids, aimed at adults who may be struggling with gambling issues, it kind of takes advantage of them in that sense, because it's the same prospect of give us money and you have a chance at something, but you might get nothing also. Or, you know, if they already have whatever's in the loot box, then it's like they still get nothing. But I don't want to just say all this just to make everyone afraid. Because, you know, what I want to do is bring light to this issue so we can figure out what can be done about it. And the biggest thing that can be done is legislation and us having our senators and governors show support for legislation in favor of ethical use, such as banning facial recognition use by police systems until it's in a proper functioning manner or having drone strikes be human operated and observed at all times to prevent any automatic systems from doing damage. You know, personally, I don't think police should ever have weaponized robots. 
And if they even were to someday, definitely not anytime soon. There's already enough issues with the current police system, but that's a whole, that's for another day. And the, with the issues of data bias that exists, it could still lead to wrongful injuries or death. And there's also the issues of self-defense programs in the machines. How would a robot know the difference between someone intentionally shoving it versus someone tripping and falling? All it will know is, I've been shoved, I'm being attacked, where's the nearest assailant, and take action. And then likewise, there needs to be regulations put on companies when it comes to this. Thankfully, there's already antitrust in development against the big tech companies. And I understand that with regard to the issue of the Congo cobalt mines, it's more of a gray area because you know the mines are in Congo, but then it's co-owned as a joint venture by Congo and China, but then the materials are shipped from the Chinese company to the US. And there's just too many loopholes, but hopefully there will be some form of international regulations that can be put into effect for that. And um, I guess the biggest thing of all is just making sure that when people are initially studying for robotics, AI, engineering, things like that, they need to have proper ethics courses, even just at least two, because the majority of these, the top ranked schools, they just require one. And at that, it's one specifically catered towards cybersecurity or AI, to which obviously there'll be a bias in favor of the program because they don't want to dissuade students from studying it. But realistically, I'm not saying for you know ethics to totally dominate it, but there needs to be a certain level of just classical, like 101 ethics learning, like how to determine what's right or what's wrong on your own based on all these different theories, not just specific to your field, but in general, because there needs to be you know that level of humanity when you're thinking about how to make these machines work. So there isn't any sort of disjoint or any sort of corruption or abuse that can occur within it. Austin, we need to wrap stuff up as soon Perfect as we possibly timing. can. Oh, is it? Oh, okay, yeah. fabulous, great. Angelina, you're next. Yes, all righty, take two. Thank you, Austin. And then if, if we've got a few minutes then we'll grab some questions, okay? If people have questions for um, Austin, please put them in the chat so that I can then just just read them off when, when uh, Angelina's uh, done. All righty. So is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. All right, great. So good morning. My name is Angelina Ferrallo. Um, what really got me very interested in this topic is I originally came into my college as a computer science major. I did coding for a few years in high school. I was always very interested in technology, but I'm now a law major. So I really liked how this topic came about because it's kind of like an intersection of both. So technology is an innovation that has become more prominent in our society than ever within the last 10 years. However, at what cost, if any, are we giving up our privacy and rights for a convenience is the conversation that we will be having today. So according to a report by NPR in January 2020, roughly one in four U.S. adults over the age of 18 own a smart speaker such as the Amazon Alexa. This translates to about 60 million people owning over 157 million smart speakers with some families owning multiple. While the added convenience of voice commands and syncing personal data from your phone may be helpful at times, privacy policies of smart speakers such as the Amazon Alexa and Amazon Echo have come under fire and controversy in recent years. So in 2019, the New York Times, along with many other news sources, reported that smart speakers such as the Amazon Alexa never stop recording background noise and private conversations. While it is marketed and designed to essentially only listen when commanded, it has been proven that this is not the case, even when it's not triggered with, they call it a wake word. And that's just as simple as just saying like Alexa. At the time, many people began to report that they had a conversation with a friend regarding a particular store or product while near their Alexa, only to then get an ad for it online when on their computer or their phone, but they had never searched for it before. And while a smart speaker is fun and it's interactive, as long as one understands the certain level of privacy that you are essentially waiving by just owning one. And as many other websites and apps do, they do collect an individual's information and for which third party programs are embedded into smart speakers such as the Amazon Alexa have access to as well. The Amazon Alexa is access to the type of music you listen to, shopping lists, what other smart home products are in your house, and even the information on your phone. 
The question is, though, who's on the other of the other end of the conversation that the Alexa inevitably records. So the New York Times explained that while the Alexa algorithm is what processes the words of the recording, it will always lead back to some form of human presence. A second form of technology that nearly every household, at least in the United States, has is Wi-Fi systems. And not many know, but this innovation does not just have the ability to stream data to and from our devices, but it also does have the potential and abilities to track human movement and motion through a building, through walls, furniture. This system is known as RF capture, and it uses wireless signals to track movement by transmitting and analyzing wireless signals that bounce off people. Trained individuals that use this program are then able to put a three-dimensional model of someone's silhouette, including their height and their body shape. And RF capture is a much more recent invention. It's not something that all Wi-Fi routers have access to. However, it does have the potential to be used for good. For example, one of the purposes that it could be used for and is beginning to be used for is in homes with the elderly to monitor if they fall and if you know they're not living in, with anyone in that particular room. And this type of technology is then referred to as technology-enabled care or TEC. So moving into the healthcare system. The industry has also greatly experienced modernization at rapid levels. One form of this is with biotechnology. And in recent years, scientists have been carefully studying the chemical and genetic makeup of cells and have now developed tools that can be used to edit human DNA, work on manipulating various viruses or even plant life. While it is extraordinary, there are many ethical concerns that are involved with this, as well as the due to risk that rewriting the chemical makeup of matter does. The most common use of medical biotechnology has been working with living cells and cell materials that are used to create pharmaceutical products that may diagnose, treat, or prevent human illnesses. And one of these controversial technological inventions are CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R. It's a protein that is, well, it's a system that uses a protein called CAS9, which according to Western Governors University is a molecular, essentially scissors that can cut DNA. And it can be used as a form of genetic engineering to create, create correct gen genetic defects and to treat and prevent diseases. However, on the downfall, it has actually been connected towards uh, creating tumors in patients and leading to cancer. Another technological innovation that has grown more popular over the years is the use of genetic testing. So these tests can be done through a doctor's office, but it's now switched to more of a consumer market through the use of Ancestry DNA and 23andMe. Such genetic and ancestry kits are not only for individuals to learn more about their ancestry, but it also enables them to be tested for gene mutations and notify the individual if they're at higher risk of further developing any types of diseases such as cancer, Alzheimer's, or Parkinson's. While the consumer versions of these tests should not be the sole factor of deciding a treatment, these technologies and innovations are allowing for individuals to have greatest, greater access of knowledge of their health. The potential negatives of biotechnology may not always be linked to the technology itself, however. The potential, because it is so new, it may actually pose a risk to human life in critical trials. It tends to be very costly as well, and it can also prevent a border between lower income families that may not have access to such technological health care. And there are on the more drastic side concerns of bioterrorism, however, that's harder to kind of prove. And this image here is a, an image of a robotic surgery. And that is something that is becoming very more prominent in hospitals and in the healthcare industry. So the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality published a case study in 2016 looking at the risk and rewards of such innovations. They used the example of a 66-year-old man who saw a urologist for difficulty urinating and was soon diagnosed with localized prostate cancer. His doctor recommended his prostate be removed through a minimally invasive robotic surgery and explained how he was done. The patient was told that this was the safest procedure, that the robot would create only a small incision, much more smaller than a human surgeon would, and it would have better control of the instruments and lower risk of complications. However, the patient experienced quite the opposite. The time of the procedure, the robot experienced a mechanical malfunction, its arm stopped working, and the procedure took twice as long as it should have to complete. Postoperatively, the patient experienced severe bleeding and required multiple blood transfusions. And it was later discovered that an artery in his pelvis had been nicked and damaged during the procedure. The patient remained much longer in the hospital than was originally expected and required several surgeries. Now, while this may seem like an extreme case, 
Technological malfunctions are very much possible with robotic assisted surgery, commonly referred to as RAS, as it shares the same risks of laparoscopic surgery, such as infection and bleeding. The difference that many people want to note is that on top of the potential for human error operating the robotic technology, there's also the additional error of the technology itself malfunctioning and failing. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, it can definitely be used for good, but you have to make sure that you are still kind of preparing for the worst and have a backup plan when using it. And there are still many benefits with robotic surgery that should still be recognized. In the bigger picture, the University of Cincinnati published that robotic surgery has been shown to allow for patients to have a shorter hospitalization, reduced pain and discomfort, minimal scarring, a faster recovery period, and during the surgery itself for greater visualization, enhanced dexterity, and greater precision. While the case study I mentioned earlier may contradict these benefits, it is important again to note that there will always be a few outlier cases or negative experience with any new innovation. However, the purpose of this conversation is to begin to decipher if the good outweighs the bad or not. Moving on to artificial intelligence. So robots are not only developed and used in the healthcare industry. Rather, robot intelligence is being introduced in many various venues. So when they were first introduced, they originally viewed as emotionless or monotone, hence the term robotic, as sometimes we use it to describe an individual that is you know, not displaying much emotion and speaking very plainly. And so this has changed as researchers are now using AI or artificial intelligence to teach robots how to distinguish emotions and social cues in hopes of improving their interactions with real people. However, not many people are on board with this for multiple reasons. So one reason being that the most individuals simply do not agree that machines should be developed in such a way that humans can feel. In addition, there is a fear that if robots become so advanced, they will begin taking over jobs from real humans in the labor industry. And according to a study from Oxford Economic in 2019, robots could take over 20 million manufacturing jobs across the world by 2030, with 40 million robots employed in China alone. Job losses due to the implementation of robots and artificial intelligence have already been identified, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, for example, Time reported that in 2020, hundreds of toll booth workers were laid off when the pandemic hit. And many companies and businesses followed suit in automating their business and production to keep operating costs low during the unpredictable pandemic. The obvious negative impact of such a prediction would be the millions of jobs that are lost in change, especially in poor econ economies that strongly depend on workers with lower skills. Perhaps a potential solution could be to implement the use of robots in conjunction with physically employed people. In this case, robots developing feelings and empathy could be beneficial to create a better work experience. Another technological innovation that is highly autonomous and was introduced in more recent years are semi-autonomous vehicles. It was supposed to be predicted that by now, 2020, 2021, fully autonomous vehicles would exist. But there's been many safety concerns that have been voiced as Tesla was the first prominent company that introduced autonomous vehicles or the concept of them that are equipped with an autopilot technology in late 2015. And the controversies with their program have been vocalized over the years as there were numerous accidents that took place as a result of a malfunction in their software. And I actually recently updated my presentation to include that in March 2021, the New York Times reported that Tesla is under again new scrutiny because the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration confirmed that they are currently investigating 23 crashes that involved semi-autonomous Tesla model vehicles that were operating on autopilot mode. So their autopilot mode is a system that depends on built-in radars and cameras to detect lane markings and account for other vehicles and objects in the road. And when working properly, it is intended to steer, brake, accelerate on its own with little to no control from the driver. Only a few days ago, I think it was actually yesterday or two days ago, Toyota actually just announced that they're launching their own line of semi-autonomous vehicles and that they would make their way to the U.S. and be available as of fall 2021. So Tesla and its chief executive, Elon Musk, again, con continues to say that their autopilot mode in their vehicles are one of the most vehicles that are the safest out there, although federal officials are still investigating serious road accidents that have involved Teslas. So on my last section of my presentation, I wanted to also touch upon law enforcement and organized crime. So technology has not 
it's not just being implemented in the common areas where you would think it is, but it's also being implemented in general and greater scales in what are called smart cities. So this is still a concept that is fairly new. These cities focus on digitizing infrastructure, public transit and vehicles in order to promote mobility and safety. And it's a newer classification in recent years, and it will still take time as the technology continues to be developed and improved for smart cities to fully come to fruition. However, some cities that are well on their way to become smart cities are Dallas, Texas, Seattle, Washington, Boston, Massachusetts, New York, New York, and San Francisco, California. So for example, in Dallas, uh, they've adopted a smart water monitoring system that can track the water usage throughout their city. That's really important to them because they are a much more arid region that does not receive a lot of rainfall. In San Francisco, California, it's the second most densely populated city in the United States. So they've implemented a smart city program that is focusing their technological efforts to reduce energy usage. So there's a commercial energy usage in the city that are transitioning to more than 300 LEED certified buildings with the goal that 100% of the city will have renewable resources. So San Francisco also hopes to broaden and enable autonomous driving that will create a connected vehicle grid to allow communication between the actual vehicles and higher end traffic guidance systems so self-driving cars can avoid congested areas. In New York, it's definitely among one of the lead cities as it hosts an annual smart city global conferences and it boasts many initiatives such as the use of smart sensors to monitor water management, waste management, traffic management, and to improve and automate aspects of tourism, navigation, and mobility. Then lastly, uh, something that was touched upon in the previous presentation, uh, predictive policing is also becoming very popular. So according to the Brennan Center for Justice, this system uses computer systems to analyze sets of criminal data, which will decide if a greater number of police should be deployed to a specific area or to identify certain individuals that are likely to commit or be victim of a crime. Some predictive policing methods focus solely on the data, while other systems implement the additional support of facial recognition and social media monitoring. So there are various concerns with such systems, as there is a level of transparency that these companies are not providing, specifically as to what kind of data is being analyzed and in what way it is being used. So the NYPD, which is the largest police force in the whole United States, it began implementing this as of 2012. And they did face a lawsuit by the Brennan Center in order to identify the firms that were behind the data and the way that they're receiving this data. And they actually filed a public records request under the Freedom of Information Law. So the NYPD was criticized for their lack of transparency because they also do not keep any audit logs of the predictions that their systems are making. And in the, these cases, there are constitutional concerns that are being raised, specifically the potential threat of rights that are protected by the Fourth Amendment, which states that there must be a reasonable suspicion in order for a police officer to stop an individual in order to prevent all lawful search and seizures. And just to quickly touch upon the drug market. So that is essentially just, it used to be a lot easier to track, but since things have moved online, pretty much if you have an internet connection and a shipping address, it's very easy to now order illegal substances online. So what makes this conversation so difficult and does not allow for a clear right or wrong answer is that we have learned that technology and modernization is here to stay. It's not going anywhere, but we need to have an understanding of these innovations and their capabilities to ensure that we're not signing away all of our rights and privacy when embracing them. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Angelina. We are well over time. Um, I do, and, and if people need to hop off, that's great and that's fine, I'll stay. I have no, I have, I, it's Saturday, I have nowhere to be. Um, <laughs> But um, I know there was at least one question in the chat from, um, and it was for you, Austin. And um, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I see it in the message. Um, yeah, you see it about the changing yeah. policies and regulating tech companies. Can yeah. you just, just read address it. that? Yeah, quickly. that was my question. I was just really, mm -hmm. I, so I really just want to say this was such a great session overall mm -hmm. and papers really fit in a neat way and just you guys did such a fabulous job. So kudos mm -hmm. and, and I look forward to seeing you all move forward in your careers um, and making this a better world. Uh, I, Austin, my question for you really was, um, you know, so I love that you sort of looked at a more macro level of how, what kind of changes we could make because that's so important. Um, but on a personal life, like, so how do you, um, 
what do, do I, how do I adjust my own life? How do you adjust your own life to avoid participating in some of these systems just on your, in your own life? Or do you just sort of acknowledge it? Like we acknowledge that Amazon's this awful company and it's, made, it's increasing poverty and yet we all still use it. Or are there things that you say, I'm going to boycott that or I'm going to boycott, I'm, I'm not going to use certain things. Um, you know, I'm not going to use to a Angelina, you know, I'm not going to use Alexa because I know that she's listening to me all the time. Like, do we boycott certain things on a personal level? Because obviously the policy stuff is, is what's going to make the most change. Yeah, I was going to say like, there's comes a certain threshold where we as individuals, we can do all we want, but if there's no legislative action right. or corporate action, then it's all null. Like, like the common example, BP is the one who perpetuated the whole carbon footprint theory, trying to shift the blame to the individual. When in reality, 73% of the world's pollution is by 100 corporations. So if there's like, right. we can do all we want. We can you know, boycott certain companies because we not only feel it's wrong, but also we may have a certain level of privilege to be able to not partake with these companies because Amazon is can be considered somewhat affordable for people because it's so it's cheaper than going in person for certain things if someone can't really afford to not use Amazon but right. there's and likewise with um with the racial computer practices that's entirely not even something individual that's a matter of like the teams and the groups that are collecting data the researchers that are putting it together and then, you know, what data do these programmers choose to use? So I guess, like you were saying before, the best thing that we can really do as individuals with regard to these two specific examples are doing our best to show, not show support to those companies that we, that we deem to be behaving in ill practice, and also doing our best to reach out to local, state, and federal legislation in hopes that, you know, our voices will be heard and have them show support for bills that will create more ethical justice and likewise have them denounce certain laws that might allow for more injustices to occur. Okay. Thank you. I just want to take any other questions, quick questions. I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you very much to all four presenters. Your work is tremendous and very valuable and very much a part of many conversations and I know that I've been involved with. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And um, I wish you all the very, very best of luck. And thank you all for staying a little bit over time. Um, as again, this was really informative. So wish Great. you all well, happy Saturday. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye now, bye-bye.